American crimes of trust happen behind closed doors. Chinese families, you know, because of the respecting of the seniors, you know, because of the hierarchy, if there was a victim, uh, they wouldn't even come out to say something about that. See changes in how your neighbors are. If you had somebody who goes to a senior center and all of a sudden they're becoming withdrawn or they're not eating well, they are starting to not bathe, then something is going on. If it's an adult child or a spouse, they're limiting the person's contact with service providers, doctors, other family members. You're noticing there's unexplained falls or unexplained bruises. Those are things to really be looking for. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Welcome to The Zoomer. I'm Libby Snymer. Every year, thousands of Canadian seniors report being victims of elder abuse. In 2018 alone, more than 12,000 people aged 65 and older did so, many of them stating that their abuser was a family member. So many more cases, however, go unreported, either out of fear, embarrassment, or the inability to reach out for help. We'll explore what you should know to protect your loved ones, but before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Did you know one in six older adults worldwide have been abused in the past year? And as many as two out of three people with dementia suffer abuse. Elder abuse is one of the most underreported crimes in Canada. It's estimated that only 20% of incidents are ever reported. Typically, victims know their abuser. Family members commit two thirds of elder abuse cases. The most common abuse perpetrated by family is financial abuse, affecting over 60,000 Canadian seniors. But it can take many forms, including physical, emotional, sexual harm, and neglect. Elder abuse has been called the silent crime. But together, we can shatter that silence. According to Statistics Canada, the majority of senior victims who reported family violence live with the person who victimized them, which may also explain why so many cases go unreported. Experts say victims are embarrassed, they feel helpless, and also fear that they won't be believed. What do you find in your practice? Well, I find exactly that situation, that there are older adults who have one way or another made themselves dependent on a family member. And um, when someone, an older adult, is living with a family member and abuse is taking place, it can be terrorizing because the older adult may not feel a safe, a safe way to escape the abuse. And so um, the abuse is overlapping. It may be financial, that's the most common. But when there's financial abuse, there also may be emotional abuse and, and physical abuse. And so it's, uh, it's a complicated problem. I would imagine that it's more complicated when people have dementia. Absolutely. Um, of course, we want people to have their own autonomy and be involved in their decision making. But when there is that layer of dementia, we really need to be assessing them. Do they have capacity? Do they have the, the insight to make this decision? So capacity is the ability to understand and appreciate the consequences of your decisions. And so we have to work really closely and carefully with people with dementia to make sure that they do still have that capacity in making decisions about abuse. Any insight into why it happens? I mean, a family member takes in an elder, possibly at the beginning with the best of intentions. How does it devolve into violence? Well, from our experience, uh, it's a complicated situation. So what ends up happening, it's always good intention. But sometimes the caregiver doesn't realize the amount of care that's necessary. There's caregiver burnout. Sometimes the elder may exhibit cognitive behaviors that are inappropriate, they act out. They may even threaten the caregiver and become a danger to that individual. And so there's a whole bunch of layers to take apart. As Graham said, when you're looking at a situation, somebody's dependent on you financially, there may become some emotional commitment. I don't want to tell my child, you're not handling my money appropriately, you're depriving me of something because it affects the relationship, and we need those. 
Lily, before I talked about the situation in Chinese community, I just want to mention about the statistics that you quoted by the Statistics Canada, right? Uh, but I'm not sure uh, if the Chinese community is represented, you know, because uh, when I read the report, right, I never, you know, see the people uh, doing the survey using Chinese language, right? And uh, there was a recent report by NICE, actually they have done research, a report comes out in 2015, and the methodology that they use is actually a telephone survey uh, with the uh, English and French language kind of a survey, right? And it is the largest, actually, national survey so far in the world, but there's no Chinese representation in their survey because uh, according to the recent uh, data, uh, the Chinese from mainland China, so for example, uh, immigrated to China, uh, to Canada, of course, 80% um, uh, of them don't speak either English or French, right? Uh, so uh, national data may not cover the story about the Chinese communities. And I don't know actually what is the situation about the Chinese communities because we, we haven't done much of the research about the prevalence um, um, uh, rate, you know, the research about the Chinese communities. Right. May I interject? To Let, let's just uh, hear from Bill for a sec. It's apparently more common in rural communities. Uh, you're from... It, it is, uh, yes, I'm from Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia, we have one of the highest reported rates in, in the country, and we know that uh, uh, those are much lower than the actual. Uh, CARP actually runs a program in uh, Nova Scotia where we do programs for seniors teaching them how to avoid scams and, and frauds, including uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of action. And what we find so often is people come up and tell us after about their personal experiences with it. We say, well, did you report it? And oh no, either they were too ashamed to report it, that they could have been, been duped by something like this, or they don't want to tell tales on a family member, a friend, or, uh, or a caregiver, because that's the only person in the world they have to uh, relate to. Well, I just want to respond to Professor Zhang by saying that um, in my experience of 21 years as a staff litigation lawyer, litigating elder abuse claims on behalf of survivors of elder abuse, this is really a pan-cultural problem. I don't have any statistics on any particular cultural community, but I can tell you that I've had persons of every cultural background come through my door, and often with the use of interpreters where the person can't speak English. And the, uh, the cultural effect may be more profound in some communities than others. Per, per, uh, for example, Asian communities have a very high respect for older adults uh, in comparison to many Western cultures. But the same problem happens again and again, uh, no matter the uh, background of the person. Okay. When we come back, we'll discuss physical abuse and neglect and what you should look for if a loved one is in danger. Stay tuned. <laughs> The doctors may have a misconception about the uh, elder abuse, but for physical abuse, yes, it's very clear. Welcome back. According to some estimates, up to 10% of seniors will experience abuse. That would mean there are about 650,000 victims now based on current population estimates. 60% of senior abuse victims are women and they are more likely to be abused by a spouse than another family member. So what are the telltale signs that someone is a victim? Well, it's a very good question that you ask, Libby, because there's, there's seven types of abuse and each one has their own different signs. But a common one to look forward to, especially if you live in rural Ontario like I do, is to see changes in how your neighbours are. If you had somebody who goes to a senior centre and all of a sudden they're becoming withdrawn or they're not eating well, they are starting to not bathe or um, they are fearful, then something is going on. And the best way to deal with it in a lot of cases is to start a simple conversation to find out what is going on with these people. Uh, let me just ask, couldn't all of those things be an indication just a, of a worsening condition? It could be, absolutely. I think that 
you know, we don't want to generalize. Every case will be so different, but it is th they are they are things that we need to keep our eyes open for. Other things to pay attention to is if. Um, you know, the person, if it's an adult child or a spouse, they're limiting the person's contact with pr service providers, doctors, other family members. And I think that it's safe to say a lot of us have those gut instincts. And if you feel that something's wrong and you feel like there are red flags, like Elizabeth said, speak to the person. Say, I've noticed this and I'm concerned. Let's talk about what's going on. I'm here if you need me. Mm -hmm. I think that it is, there is some ways that that could be the worsening of the condition, but it's also about how the person's acting, what they're presenting with, if they seem a little bit more, you know, reserved, if it's out of character for them, if you're noticing there's unexplained falls or unexplained bruises, those are things to really be looking for. Have, in your experience, does just opening the conversation uh, release the floodgates? It may, uh, but only if there's a an assurance of uh, confidentiality and that the older adult is not losing power and control over the situation. I think the common thread is that isolation is the enemy of healthy aging. And when abuse is taking place, it's more likely to take place when the person is isolated from their faith community or their uh, cultural community, from their families and friends, from their neighbors, from those who can give them support. Because often elder abuse is a crime. It's not always. But when people commit crimes, they don't usually commit them at the corner of Young and Bloor unless they're wearing a mask to conceal their identity. Most often crimes of trust happen behind closed doors. And so to disclose the person who has lost power and control over the relationship, the older adult who's a survivor of the abuse, needs to be assured in some way that they are not further losing power and control over the disclosure process. Bill, have you had experience asking those kinds of questions? Oh yes, very much so. And uh, when, when we ask, uh, we, we find first of all that, that people are often reticent uh, to say anything. And when they do, they're being very cautious. One of the, the problems is uh, in many parts of the country, there is no duty to report uh, that. Uh, so people who might notice, for instance, financial abuse, whether it's the banks, financial institutions, places like that, uh, don't have to report and aren't trained to, to do so. And one of the things that we've been asking for in the eastern provinces is more control around that that area, making sure that when uh, when there's some suspicious, uh, some suspicion of uh, of this kind of thing being perpetrated, that it be followed up on. Now, uh, in the Chinese community, Chinese culture, the respect for elders, and there's an expectation. Right. And um, I remember reading, even in China, with the single child policy, right. that a lot of them aren't taking care of their parents, and it's a, it's a big shame. So how does that play into things? Yeah, that's uh, our assumption that Chinese families, you know, because of the respecting of the seniors, you know, because of the hierarchy of the seniors over juniors, right, and the situation for them would be better. But that's only the assumption. You know, we don't know. There's still a lot of things happening, actually, in the society. And and the only thing is if there's a victim, uh, they wouldn't even come out to say something about that, right? So the way to detect that is actually when they regularly attend in some uh, activities and suddenly they disappear from the community, that may tell something. Uh, the other th uh, you know, channel to know about the situation is through the Chinese doctors, right? Uh, the doctors might know more than the community about the situation, but the doctors may have a misconception about the uh, elder abuse, but for physical abuse, yes, it's very clear, but for other kind of emotional abuse, it's very difficult to detect. So we may even need to talk, uh, you know, uh, in Chinese communities among the doctors and, uh, and see how people perceive elder abuse. I think that's the first step for us. Right, to know. What constitutes, how do you decide that something is emotional okay. abuse? I don't know who wants to answer that. <laughs> Well, I can give you an example of emotional abuse that, that overlaps, which is uh, I can remember one occasion in particular and many other times representing an older woman uh, widowed uh, in a long-term care home whose uh, adult son or daughter has uh, sold her home using a power of attorney and absconded with the proceeds. And when I've written to the uh, adult son or daughter inquiring into the management of the finances, uh, that person comes back to the 
widow and says, Mom, if you ever see that lawyer again, you'll never see me or your grandchildren for the rest of your life. Oh. And so... You're nodding. Everybody's yes. nodding. And so I don't know that there's really a definition that comes to mind, but um, you know it when you see it. And I think of elder abuse typically as um, uh, a more powerful person taking advantage of a power differential that arises because of age. And the power differential may have many different aspects. It may be in terms of caregiving. It may be in terms of transportation. It may be in terms of the most important thing that in an older person's life is their relationships, such as you'll never see me, you'll never see your grandchildren. But when you see this abuse of the power differential and it's emotionally harming to the older adult, uh, there's no doubt about it. Okay, when we come back, not all forms of elder abuse are physical, financial abuse and exploitation can leave many seniors alone, helpless and penniless. That's next. Powers of Attorney legislation in Ontario does not permit and provide the protection necessary for the person assigning it to. So a lot of people don't realize that when you assign to somebody that authority, it takes effect immediately. Welcome back. Financial abuse is the most common form of elder abuse, and tens of thousands of seniors say they've been victimized one way or another. This is usually perpetrated by those who are closest and includes everything from misusing a power of attorney to forcing somebody to make or change a will. So let's go there. there there's a whole list of things, and um, the person doing it, are they... Are, are they sometimes it's, it's telling themselves in, there's not, nothing wrong? It's not or... always intentional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, somebody will say, well, you know, Grandma would really want Susie to go to that on that school trip to Ottawa. We'll just take the $1,000 out of her account so she can do that. And once they've done that once, it happens again, and then it becomes continual that the, the unknowing elder is financing the activities of the family, and somehow the family has determined that, that probably this is all right because Grandma would pr probably want that. And, and what about, uh, oh, I'm just borrowing the money from the account. Oh, oh yes. So, Libby, there's not enough time on your show to cover all the common ones. But it starts with Let's something start. small. Let's do it. Yeah. It starts with something small. I manage retirement homes. I know stories in long-term care. And I'll come in and, and, and do your room and say, this is a beautiful mug, this Zoomer mug. And so you're going to want to give it to me to thank me for something I'm doing. And then the next time I'm going to come and get something else, and then you're going to give me more and more and more. It can start as much as $2 for changing a light bulb in a senior's apartment to as much as it's 30000 to buy a car, which are actual cases of employees that have had that. So there's a whole variety of reasons that, that happen with financial abuse, but it's usually small. And as Bill said, it's okay. My granddaughter went on vacation. It's not a problem. And then suddenly it becomes the $100 haircut because you're taking somebody to get their hair cut or the $50 to, to cut a, a patch of grass when the child next door can do it for five. I've, I've hear, heard of uh, forgery, uh, all kinds of things, and, and sometimes people get cheated out of their homes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and part of that, and, and Graham's, I rely on Graham 100%, but the powers of attorney legislation in Ontario, I don't know about the rest of Canada, does not permit and provide the protection necessary for the person assigning it to. So a lot of people don't realize that when you assign to somebody that authority, it takes effect immediately. And you have no authorization to stop them from doing what they want, from selling your condo to your car Just or anything minute. So else. If, if I've prepared a power of attorney Correct. with my family, Yes. They can exercise it now. Correct. Can you, you can't put a date on it. You can put a date, but that's where I turned it over to our lawyer. There is a thing called a condition of delayed effectiveness. So a power of attorney for property yes. takes effect as soon as it's signed, unless the power of attorney says otherwise. Can, the power can, of attorney can have a condition that it only comes into effect 
at a certain date or time or at a certain event, such as the loss of capacity. This is sometimes called a springing power of attorney. But I can tell you in my experience, power of attorney documents uh, that have a condition of delayed effectiveness are very rare. Most people who give a power of attorney have absolutely no understanding of how powerful these documents are and that they can be uh, used right away. Okay, well, I didn't even know that. <laughs> and I think, I think one of the great problems with powers of attorney are uh, uh, people uh, having the belief that, protect, that to protect themselves, they should have a power of attorney in place, when actually that's not necessarily the case, because these are extremely powerful documents. And I think the most critical feature of, a, of an attorneyship is whether you can trust the person that you're giving the power of attorney to. In that sense, giving a power of attorney is very much like getting married because if you're going to get married, you really need to trust the person that you're getting married to. And getting married is not for everyone. If it's your idea to get married and you know who you want to get married to and you're sure that you can really trust that person, then God bless you, have a long and happy marriage. But if getting married is somebody else's idea and you're really unsure about who you should get married to, then the better thing is to not get married and think about it some more and the same is true of powers of attorney. Okay, uh, so a lot of people, you know, I, I remember all these little uh, booklets, you know, just do your power of attorney online, don't pay a lawyer, all of that mm. stuff. <laughs> You're laughing, Bill. Yeah, uh, yeah, they've done an, an, an amazing marketing job on, on those wills fall under the same, uh, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a minefield. Um, as, uh, as, as we know, these are powerful documents and you don't want to take that, uh, that uh, responsibility on yourself. You want it done professionally. Okay, but they can be crafted to say, if I lose capacity or when I become bedridden or whatever. If you uh, don't absolutely trust the person you're giving power and control over your finances to, while you are still mentally capable of managing your own finances, how much more would you trust them to be honest and, and to manage your finances in your best interest after you've lost capacity? It's a matter, Libby, of guardianship, and the Alzheimer's Society knows about the importance of assigning guardianship, not just for finance, but also for care of the person as yeah. a cognitive impairment goes on. Is that right? Absolutely. We're having this conversation every day. We're talking to people about the Substitute Decisions Act because there is a hierarchy for healthcare decisions that, you know, if you don't have these documents, it's going to fall to someone on this hierarchy. If you're not happy with that person, then you really need to think about putting a power of attorney in place to make sure that someone you trust and know will make decisions based on your best interest is able to make those decisions. And so it is something we are encouraging people to do, but we do want the thought and care being put into it to make sure that it's a safe decision and it has the best, you know, uh, your best interest in mind. If you don't have a power of attorney in place, there will always be uh, uh, another method. Mm -hmm. But the problem is a power of attorney is so powerful that if you uh, choose the wrong person, they let you down. The only way to uh, cancel a power of attorney if you've lost mental capacity is by a court application. Whereas if you hadn't made a power of attorney in the first place, then there would be another mechanism that might not necessarily involve going okay, to court. Okay, so if you don't have a power of attorney, what's the other mechanism? Well, another mechanism for property could be what's called a statutory guardianship, which doesn't involve going to court. It would involve someone uh, arranging for your uh, capacity assessment to manage property. If you're found incapable, the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee would have legal authority to manage, but they don't want to do it. They have the authority to delegate that to a person who applies for it. And if they uh, delegate the authority, they can also take that authority back if the power is abused. If the, pers if the decision is a personal care decision, like a treatment decision or admission to long-term care, someone can apply to the Consent and Capacity Board to become your board-appointed representative for that decision, but that avenue is not available if you have already made a power of attorney for personal care. 
Okay, it sounds uh, much more complicated than making a power of attorney. And, 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 all, and provinces are all different. Not it, all of those apply exactly. to provinces outside and, of Ontario. And I've heard stories about things that happen when people are taken care of by the public guardian. I, I've heard stories about people being That's put true. on buses and sent to another province. That's true, but the thing about a power of attorney is that, like a marriage, it can be much easier to get into than it is to get out of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. When we come back, how to tell if someone is being abused financially and what to do about it. That's next. People who have money are probably at greater risk of financial abuse. If the potential abuser wants to control the pers older person's money, they need to control the older person's wallet. Welcome back. We've just discussed all the various forms of financial abuse and why it's so difficult to report. So how can we tell if this is happening? And that can be especially difficult if the victim has cognitive challenges. So again, you've, you've outlined what's happening, but you have someone who is older, perhaps cognitively challenged, and they're fairly isolated. So who's going to know? Well, that's the real problem is that um, uh, coming back to the issue of isolation, um, I find that people who have money are probably at greater risk of financial abuse than those who have little money because uh, there's more interest where there's uh, an estate. And uh, secondly, if the um, potential abuser wants to control the pers older person's money, they need to control the older person as well. And so this often involves um, distancing the person from uh, other people who could help them, like their faith and cultural groups, their family, their neighbors, their friends. And so to detect, I think the early warning sign is that the person is either uh, no longer able to communicate with others around them, or when they are in their presence, that someone wants to speak for them. They won't let them talk for themselves. The other thing that Graham did mention is you're more at risk of financial abuse if there's money involved. However, if there isn't money involved, then children or the POAs may choose to abandon the elder. Yes. So they stop taking care of their, their needs. They may be neglecting that elder mm -hmm. so that they go hungry or they may need medical attention and they're not receiving it. So it also has its negative repercussions as well. Or abandonment after the money is exhausted. In other words, once oh. the money is gone, then the older adult is dumped, which happens routinely. Or the money's mismanaged, right? We I have a lot of cases where the family member doesn't want the older adult to be moving into long-term care, despite the fact that that person really would benefit from long-term care and it's no longer safe at home. But the family member really wants them to stay at home because they're dependent on those finances. They're dependent on their OAS and CPP. And it becomes this really intertwined dependency and really complicated. And that's why safety planning and you know creative problem solving so, really is So important. how do you deal with it? Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> it's different for every case, but I think you know, some general strategies, especially for financial support is, or sorry, financial abuse is, does this person need an income? If it's an adult child, do we need to apply for OW or ODSP, which are through our social assistance? You know, is there a way that we can secure this person's support, uh, financial support, so it's given only to the older adult so that the perpetrator or the abuser, whatever you want to call them, doesn't have access to that? How can we make sure that this finances goes to the older adult and is used appropriately? Well, even if they have other money, presumably they can get hold of it if they... Mm -hmm. and, and one of the contributing problems is that the, uh, the courts, the crowns basically, don't take this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, action uh, as seriously as we think they should. Mm -hmm. uh, you, if you rob a bank, get $5,000, you can be sent to jail for years. Mm -hmm. If you uh, scam $100,000 out of your grandmother, you'll probably get a slap on the, the wrist if, if that and probably not even have to restitute. And one of the reasons that uh, we're told by, the, uh, uh, by the, the police is that they don't have the capacity to investigate all of these. There are too many of them. And when they do, the crowns are uh, 
unlikely to want to uh, uh, to follow through with them because it's so hard to prove. Um, mm -hmm. We know this often happens. If I can move to to the love scams, where where oh. so, someone will will uh, take five, ten, a hundred thousand dollars from from a person uh, who they're in in a relationship uh, with, and uh, when you go to the to the uh, police or other authorities, they say, but but you gave that to the person. You said that that they could have it. So their their hands are tied. We really need the the law to take a stronger stand. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, something that happened to a good friend of mine, so four kids. Uh, her mother just passed away recently, but was, you know, ill and failing for a long time, and only one of them lived in the same town. And then they, she, afterwards, they find out that uh, one of the brothers, because uh, I think they had joint powers of attorney, took $100,000. Mm -hmm. They don't want to report it. No. That's but, not uncommon. I was at a conference organized recently by CARP in London. It was raised to the police officer, and the answer was, you're going to spend thousands, 50,000, 60,000 in civil action against another family member to retrieve what? And it tears families apart. Yes. Mm -hmm. It tears families apart. I, I, you go ahead. Yeah, for the Chinese family, it's, it's usually built on the trust system. If that breaks, right, uh, the way people do that is actually have a mutual help group. So they exchange ideas and trying to get experience from others and trying to prevent from uh, happening. The other thing is, uh, you know, the service providers may speak Chinese, right, and then they can provide some of the help there. But uh, usually, they may not even come to you uh, because of the shame involved with this. I think it's important to know that um, even though what's been said is, is generally true, uh, police and Crown attorneys are trying to train themselves better on investigating elder abuse. For example, the Ontario Police College in Elmer, Ontario is running in a pilot project, an elder abuse investigators course, uh, very, very intensive. And we're hoping that initiatives like these will help to increase the awareness of police, law enforcement agencies and Crown attorneys. Okay. When we come back, we will take some questions from the audience. That's next. Here's my situation. Is there an elder abuse prevention network someplace I can report to? Who can I talk to within my local police force? Welcome back. We'll now take questions from our audience, starting with Paul. Hey, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. Um, in my situation, um, I'm an only child. I have no other siblings. I have, my parents are gone. So I do have a, a wife, but say she predeceases me with no children. I'm all by myself. Now, who is going to advocate for me uh, as I get older? Um, is there is, organizations? Are there people who could I could call upon to say, I'm going to need some looking after as a third party, uh, someone who is not biased, someone who is, uh, who could look out for me? I, I understand the power of attorney, and I'm thinking that we have powers of attorney uh, in our family. Now, now it doesn't sound like such a panacea, but still I would need, I'm wondering what, you know, if I'm all by myself, how do I have someone look after me with my best interest? That's a very good question, Paul. I know in the state of Minnesota, they have something they call a, a, an honest lawyer system where you can actually go to an organization like a foundation and contract out your needs, whether it'll be financial or it'll be social services. But in Ontario, it's the public guardian and trustee model unless you assign it to someone else. Am I correct, Graham? No, that's true. And I think what you really need to do, Paul, is to draw on your personal relationships because there are not organizations that are going to be able to ride to your rescue and, and come to your aid on your behalf, save and except for the public guardian and trustee, which does do good work, but um, you're a, a small fish in a big pond. And so if I can give you an example, I had a client who walked to my office until she was 98 and a half years old. 
Uh, she was a widow. She'd been widowed for more than 50 years. And having been a woman who came of age during the Depression, she was a childless widow. She'd outlived all her siblings, all her nieces and nephews. Uh, but um, she had a, a very, she was a very social woman, and she had made friends with a man who helped her, and she trusted him. And in her old age, he helped her as well by uh, giving her the kind of support that uh, you're thinking of. And you're a person who is well situated to make a power of attorney because most of the um, hierarchies and the, the default mechanisms uh, don't work all that well for you okay. because you don't have the, you don't have the, the next of kin relationships that would normally, that would normally apply. Yeah. And so it's a situation where you really have to exercise your best judgment and try to come to that very difficult question of who is it, if anyone you can trust? And if you can't trust anyone for sure, if you're not so sure about it that you would be getting married, don't do it. There will be a default. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I really want to say that I'm worried that this panel has made people fearful of, of signing powers of attorney. And I think that going back to that, powers of attorney can be really amazing documents that pro offer a lot of support and structure. I think what we are hoping is that we are prefacing to people that you need to really make sure you trust the person that you are designating that power to and having those conversations with them to make sure that they are making decisions in your best interest. And if they're not, then looking at other agencies, the Alzheimer's Society, Advocacy Centre, about how do I make sure that it's clear what I want and it's, a, it's going to work in the way that I need it to. So I don't want people to be afraid of assigning these documents and, and having a power of attorney. I think that we just want people to be mindful that it is important who you decide to take that on. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Next. Okay. Next question from Ramona. Hello, Ramona. Hello there. I'm from BC, and in British Columbia, there is um, Crime Stoppers where you can report abuse, senior abuse. Is there anywhere like that in Ontario or the rest of Canada? Crime Stoppers, you report, and you're totally anom anonymous. Yeah, we've got Crime Stoppers here. So for elder abuse, you could visit the Ontario Society of Senior Citizens Organization's website. We have a complete list of everybody you could possibly reach out to in Ontario. But a really easy starting point for people is to call 211, which I believe is national right now. Mm -hmm. And you can say, here's my situation. Is there an elder abuse prevention network someplace I can report to? Who can I talk to within my local police force? The police will come. They don't come with sirens and their cars blaring. They'll send somebody plain clothes to talk to you about that if they think there's some risk and harm that may be immediate. Um, there can be, if there's medical, then there's, you know, could be associated with the, the various uh, medical professional associations. If it involves a lawyer, there's the law societies and so on. But I, I'd start with, unless there's immediate risk of harm, I'd start with 211 and say, where do I go? If the, uh, if the abuse concerns a person who has diminished mental capacity, the person might not be mentally capable of making their own decisions. And as a result of that incapacity, they're suffering serious adverse effects, including uh, loss of property or inability to provide for themselves. Then in Ontario, a person could make a report to the Guardianship Investigation Unit of the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee, who has more extensive powers of investigation under Ontario law than the police have under the criminal code. And, and so that would not necessarily be an uh, anonymous process, but it would be a confidential process in the sense that the public guardian and trustee would not release personal information to third parties. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Ramona. When we come back, final thoughts from our panelists. That's next. Don't forget, for free tickets to the show, go to www.universe.com and search Zoomer Media. And log on to www.thezoomertv.com for full episodes and more.
Welcome back to the Zoomer. It's now time for final thoughts from our panelists, starting to my left. Well, I think that to prevent abuse in your own life, the most important thing is to retain power and control over your finances, over your decision making, not to delegate that to other people if you can avoid it. And with respect to powers of attorney, which are very powerful documents, not to necessarily fear them, but to respect them in the way you would respect other uh, significant relationships like a marriage, for example. I think my takeaway would be that uh, we need stronger laws to prevent elder abuse and more stringent ways of making sure people who are in a position to observe them uh, are required to report them. Uh, for me, uh, we need to understand the root cause of the elder abuse and then we know how to prevent that. Many times the elder abuse is because of other problems in the society, because of the family breakdown, because of the ageism in the society, the sexism and racism, you know, that is exists in the society and that, you know, impact on the family relationships. So we need to deal with all those societal issues. I'm a sociologist, so, you know, <laughs> I need to uh, go through those uh, kind of questions. Go ahead. I think it's important to have these conversations and not wait until you know you're in a position where you truly need a power of attorney to become active. Um, I think it's about uh, being proactive and and speaking about this early, deciding and exploring what your options are. And I'm glad that we're having this conversation, and I hope that we continue to. I'd like to concur with everything that's been said at the table, but to add just something a little bit um, extra to it. This is a complicated topic and there's many issues from legal dealing with government and societal and the additional support to tease it apart but while we're fixing all of the other challenges associated with it I think we need to tap into learning organizations such as CARP the Ontario Society of Senior Citizens your local faith-based group or cultural group all get funding every year from government to organize and present elder abuse awareness programs visit their websites I'm doing a shameless plug. We have seven mini videos on each type of elder abuse. So if you're not sure you are there, where to go, how to get to it, go Google it and okay. you'll find an answer to help. Okay. Thank you for being with us. Now the best defense can be making sure that you have all the legal documents updated and in order long before you need them. And talk to your friends and family about what you want. We'll see you soon. It's time to zoom out.